Good morning. It's a real pleasure to welcome you to this important prescient WTTC Global Summit Panel on Rebuilding Travel and Tourism in Latin America. From Mexico City to Manaus, the COVID-19 pandemic has ravaged communities throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. The region will face a fragile and uneven recovery as the COVID-19 crises may leave lasting scars on the region's economies, according to the 2021 UN World Economic Situation and Prospects report released earlier this year. The report warns that the devastating socioeconomic impact of the pandemic will be felt for years to come unless smart investments in economic, societal, and climate resilience ensure a robust and sustainable recovery of the global economy. In 2020, the world economy shrank by 4.3%, over two and a half times more than during the global crises of 2009. The modest recovery of 4.7% expected globally in 2021 would barely offset the losses of 2020. And the pandemic has ravaged countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, exacting a heavy human toll and causing an economic contraction of historic proportions. The region's GDP declined by 8% in 2020 as prolonged national lockdowns, weaker merchandise exports, and a collapse in tourism undermined economic activities. The pandemic's impact on Latin America and the Caribbean has also exposed vulnerabilities particular to the region, such as the high levels of informality in the, job, in the job sector that made it difficult for governments to manage the spread of the pandemic, despite both public closures and expanded testing efforts. Weak health systems in many countries led to unequal access to essential health services and disproportionate impact on more vulnerable communities. At the end of the day, the fundamental cleavage that we've seen play out around the world and also in Latin America is not between how left-wing or right-wing governments performed or between authoritarian regimes and liberal democracies. It's been between efficient and inefficient governments. And this cleavage has been laid to bear across our region, including the United States, particularly during the last year. Nearly a year later, with vaccination moving forward, there are reasons for cautious optimism. Latin America and the Caribbean remains a region of boundless economic potential. Its natural endowments offer unparalleled opportunities to invest in a sustainable recovery. Hemispheric trade, potential nearshoring, and sustainable tourism could stimulate investment, employment, and the diversification of economies. The pandemic certainly represents a historic opportunity for the region to embrace a transformative agenda, but certainly a long road ahead remains to repair the damage this pandemic has caused. We're in for a great panel this morning. Let me uh, introduce to you our stellar lineup of panelists. You have their bios in your materials, so I won't go into that, but let me start by presenting the Honorable Julian Guerrero, Vice Minister of Tourism in Colombia, Hugo de Sensani, Chief Executive Officer of Libertador Hotels, Resorts and Spas, Gordon Wilson, President of World Reach, and Martin Sanone, Managing Director of Eurotour. Gentlemen, let, let me sort of ask all of you uh, uh, an opening question. Uh, I'd ask you to keep your opening remarks to about three minutes max, but, but let, let's start with, with a general sort of 35 level foot question. Latin America is obviously comprised, this is something that a lot of people outside the region sometimes forget, but those of us who come from the region know very well that Latin America is comprised of many countries that have incredible diversity and that have had very diverse responses to COVID-19. What, what is one key learning from your experience in the sector in managing the crises and working to accelerate recovery in the tourism sector? And, and, and Mr. Vice Minister, can, can I sort of gently prod you to, to kick us off? 
Sure, thank you, Arturo, and hello to my panelists, my fellow panelists, and thank you very much for starting with that question. I think that one of the most important um, key lessons that, that, that we've learned in Colombia is the importance of effective communication and engagement. Since the first moment of the pandemic hit uh, Latin America and Colombia, we established a communication channel with the tourism sector in Colombia, with regional authorities, state authorities. Internationally, we also set up a coordination mechanism with the tourism authorities of the region to have a 24 seven communication to propose ideas, um, request things, uh, adopt measures, bounce ideas uh, that people might have different uh, positions about. But I think that the secret to the relative success that Colombia has had uh, in dealing with the pandemic and with all the uncertain, uncertainty that it brought and the difficulties in adopting uh, good mitigation measures last year and recovery measures uh, since the, let's say, second half of the last year and this year has been the fact that despite having differences, uh, criticisms or different views about many things, there was a permanent, permanent communication and engagement uh, way of doing things. And I think that has been the key secret to the good things that have occurred in the, in the midst of the pandemics. Thank you. Um, uh, Gordon, why, 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 why don't you um, pick this up? Sure, and, and I'll follow up on, on our previous comments. Uh, I would pick collaboration, particularly between government the travel industry in the sense of the travel service providers and also the travel facility operators. It's, it's very much the theme of safe and seamless travel journey, the collaboration that underpins that. But in the COVID crisis, it's super important to reflect a consolidated approach that the messages are going out to the audiences as, as Julian had mentioned, but also that we reflect uh, consistent processes and approach to safe and secure travel as a way to uh, deal with the current crisis, both sort of in the short term and as we come out of this in the medium and longer term and assuring that the confidence is there for the traveler, that they can feel comfortable coming to the facilities, that they see the processes that are in operation and that there's a consistent process, regardless of whether they're flying into a particular country, going through an airport, taking a, a shuttle to the cruise terminal, jumping on a cruise, that the whole end-to-end -end journey has to be consistent and that requires a large amount of collaboration. Well, Thank you very much. Uh, I echo uh, what both um, of the previous speakers have uh, commented on collaboration. I think it has been crucial. Um, I think another key learning is uh, humility in many aspects. Um, Unless you've been around working in the industry for 100 years, these chances are this was the first pandemic that you got to experience. So there's a lot of things that we didn't, didn't know and we had to act fast. Uh, and in some cases, you know, governments have been better and worse at, okay, let's try this, but if it doesn't work, let's, let's try this. Uh, we have done it at the private sector. Um, we started, you know, with all kinds of protective measures that actually we learned later that weren't effective. Um, at one point, masks were good. At one point, masks were bad. At one point, you had to wear a double mask. Um, we've been back and forth. And I think one key learning is <clears throat> the humility to be able to look back and say, well, we tried this, it didn't work. Uh, especially when it came to putting measures that you thought were in the best interest of, of public health, but uh, damaged the economy. Uh, it was particularly uh, interesting to see governments to say, well, we, we, of course, priority one is saving lives, but actually this is not helping us in what we need to accomplish, but on the other hand, it's uh, damaging uh, 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 the economy or a particular segment like travel, for example. I think that's number one, humility, it's adaptability <clears throat> that we've seen in all, in all people and also resiliency, uh, as I've seen in our industry. Um, you know, we, we have seen our people um, try to find ways to keep their businesses alive. Uh, we've seen companies that reinvent themselves from do, doing fashion design to doing mask design. And I think that has been a beautiful uh, sight to see uh, of humanity, uh, how we've ad adapted to the crisis. Martin? Thanks, I think my, my mates have said a lot already, but um, I think collaboration is one key thing and 
just to figure out at, at, who is the enemy. And it's not us, it's not our competitors, it's not the governments. We are, on the, we are all on the same tempest, we're different boat sizes, different boat qualities. But we need to understand that if we don't all get to the safe port together, it will just take longer to, to recover. And if we just bring back something that happened in the process, the Vessel Circle met to do discuss the topics and do a case study. Action in an, on an island, and the discussion was about what to do, what not to do, overreactions. So one key learning right here is that we could have foreseen some uh, some situations, probably not as extreme as this one, but we can learn, or we can just try to learn beforehand what to do in case something that, like this happened without all the stress of just dealing with it or tackling the, the problem as it is happening. And the other thing that I think it's a, it's a key learning, at least for me, is uh, I'm not sure we learned a lot about the pandemic. We're still discussing about some simple and obvious guidelines that are proven to bring us back in, into normal life, such as face covers, uh, social distancing, ventilation, personal hygiene, we learn a lot about um, uh, homework and virtual meetings, but are we just making decisions based on what's, what we are more comfortable with? Or are we basing decisions on data and defining with the data risk level? So I think those are the three things, uh, my takeaways. You, you've, you've mentioned some, some key words here that, that I think will be a recurring uh, uh, a part of the discussion communication and narrative, collaboration, humility, trial and error, adaptability, and resiliency. And I, I think that we're gonna we're gonna bump into some of these ideas that you've thrown out here at the outset throughout throughout our conversation. But let let, let me let me, especially those of you who as as a as a recovering diplomat and former government official for 20 years, I, I know that Julian won't be too amused that I'm gonna pose the question to the other side of the aisle, but but let me ask Gordon and Hugo and, and Martin, sort of what, what by looking at the region, um, sort of what, what has been done well and correctly by governments? I'm not asking you for specific examples of government A or government B, but what, what are some of the things that governments in the region, as you see the region, have done well to try and mitigate the effects of the pandemic on tourism, and and where have they failed? Mis sort of on what issues have they failed miserably? Ugo, I, I see you. I, I see you <clears throat> grasping for air there. If you, um, okay, it's a, it's a complex question, um, and as you mentioned before, there's a, it's a very heterogeneous region, so it's hard to kind of like. Um, put everything in one bucket, but I'd say <clears throat> that uh, there are three levels. Um, and you know, the first one has been dealing with the immediate impact and that's uh, giving economic relief to the industry. And we've seen some examples that have worked better than others. Uh, some, some that work better are, are companies that actually do specific measures for the travel industry. Um, you know, um, it, uh, Vice Minister Guerrero happens to be here, but Colombia has been one of those that have done uh, tremendous things to help the business, like removing uh, VAT, I believe, and a couple of other measures that have been very, very I, I good. Fully, I fully concur. Yeah, um, and, and and you know we've seen we've seen countries that have given some some measures that are specific for the industry too, because what what we want is to keep the uh, human and physical infrastructure alive. So when we need to recover, we don't, we don't recover from, from, from a lower development level. So we lose all those that great people that it took years to form or that great businesses that go bankruptcy. Uh, if we lose them, they're gonna be worse equipped to handle the recovery. And I think measures that target keeping people in the industry and keeping businesses from, from, uh, from bankruptcy have been quite successful in the region. A second, a second aspect um, has to do with um, getting people back to travel during the pandemic. 
And I think, uh, I think there Latin America has not been as successful as other regions that have taken a regional approach, like Europe, for example, or even Australia with New Zealand that did travel corridors at one point. I don't know if they continue to have them or not. We've done that more in silos. And you, know, you have countries like Chile that are in a total frontier lockdown, um, or you have countries like Mexico where you can just breathe in without even having a PCR test or, or a quarantine. And, and that, that's the spectrum. And I think, um, you know, uh, I think we could have done better as a region to get alignment because countries cannot get COVID. People get COVID. You know, so at the, at the end of the day, it's better to focus on people than to focus on, on countries. Um, and the third aspect is the recovery and how you go out and, and, and you know, and, 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 and make sure that what comes the post COVID is as good or even better as we used, as, as what business used to be in the back. In, before, uh, and I think governments have a crucial role in promoting their destination and taking advantage of the crisis. And we've seen some Caribbean islands, for example, that now are you know are allowing people to become temporary residents and boosting tourism by allowing people to do home office from a pristine beach in the Caribbean. I think that's brilliant. Uh, we're going to have a, a, a very well hit region. We're going to have less airflow because a lot of the airlines are on Chapter 11 in our region and are not getting help by governments like in Europe or Asia. So we're going to have less flights. It's going to be a more expensive destination. And I think countries need to um, need to work in, in being as attractive or even more att attractive than they used to be in the past to compete with that those other destinations. Um, Gordon and Martin, um, you know, as, as, as we as the world and many countries move towards recovery, there's obviously going to be, and it's already, we're already sort of diving into that. There's going to be a need to remove some of the travel barriers that have been in place uh, for the past year. How, how do you rebuild travel conf confidence to accelerate the recovery? And let me ask of, of, um, of uh, Julian sort of the, the, the burning question, which is out there and, you know, just go on social media. And I, I've seen, I don't know, uh, 10 articles, nine articles in the last week about this issue, sort of what should be, if any, the role of, of the so-called vaccine passports? Um, do we need them? Are they discriminatory, as many are saying, particularly here in the US and in the UK? Sort of how, how do you see these, these things interplaying? So Gordon and, and Martin, if, if you can take a stab at sort of how do you rebuild traveler confidence and, and then ask the vice minister to sort of, uh, and obviously you can all jump into uh, either of these questions, but sort of what do we do with vaccine passports and what's your view on, on the need to develop protocols in that regard? Well, I'll, I'll jump in. I'm actually working on the uh, WTTC uh, interoperability uh, working group on that area. So we get a lot of good information and, it, and there is a plethora of approaches to this. I think at the very highest level, at 35,000 foot level, as you said, um, we're going to have to do a combination of approaches with it. We can't require vaccines, although people, you know, ideally would like to have some, and a large portion of the population will. Um, we have to allow that there's testing and, and the combination, and reality is just the time it takes to get the vaccines rolled out globally. There will be a dual approach of both vaccine certificates and test certificates. Um, that we'll be able to use in that process. And those who wish to have testing, I know um, uh, Peru, there was a presenter from Peru at, at WTTC weekly meetings who talked about what they're doing at the airport about two months ago. And, and they're doing testing within five to 10 minutes, you get the results, it's low cost, and they're doing it for all people even transiting the airport. So there are mechanisms that allow this to be implemented in a reasonably cost effective and fast manner that allow the flow of people, even those who haven't had vaccines or won't have vaccines for various reasons. And, and it is a non-discriminatory approach to do that. So I think there are ways that we can accommodate it. And those who do choose to have the vaccine or have the ability to get it because uh, early distribution will come to their country faster, perhaps. Um, sure, that'll help us all with herd immunity over time. Um, and I don't think it's a one or the other situation. We, we have to allow for the fact that there can be combinations. And that will, that will raise the confidence of travelers, in my opinion, as well, to feel that they're comfortable in tight quarters on, on planes, ships, etc., and uh, result in a safe and happy journey as well for those who are participating. Martin? 
Um, I think there's many things that we need to do, but I want to focus just on two. One is um, we need to preach by example. We are the travel industry. We are the people who our clients look at when they are starting to think or dream about travel. And we are the first ones who need to start traveling again. We need to go to congresses. We need to go to travel shows, travel fairs. We need to go on holidays abroad. We need to travel. And we need to demonstrate that travel is not just um, the risk can be managed. So it's not that if you just go, uh, you just go ill. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is no one forgets all the images of 13 months ago, what happened in March and how stressful situations uh, a lot of passengers around the world suffered. I mean, I, there's thousands of stories. I, I just want to, to piggyback on one that we had um, in Argentina. Just imagine, imagine a German couple uh, stranded in, in Argentinian Puna in a small town where people do not speak German, do not speak English, they do not speak Spanish. They're five hours away from the nearest airport on a non-paved road. And we're trying to, to, to help them just get back to Germany. And we're their friendly voice on the phone. We are their friends. We are their family while in Argentina. And people thank for that. So that's part of what we do, part of what we have to just change our business model, change our service levels, change our, the way we redesign our services just to give this kind of assurance. And, um, and it's not a matter of money. Many things can be done very easily. Just uh, what we did back then was put our accident protocol in place and, and a team just to deal with it as if, as if it were an accident. And this just, in, in the end, we figured it out. It just redefined what we have to do, what we have to, how we do our marketing, what we propose or our services are as a DMC. So basically it's, uh, I think we need to look at this and see how our business model needs to change so that we just give more confidence to people and not base confidence on a, on just a passport or just an insurance on COVID on just uh, uh, screening or vaccines. There's a plethora of things we need to do and each one needs to just tackle what's nearest to it. So in, 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 in their overall, we, ju we just show an industry that, that is just manages risk. Mr. Ministro. Thank you, Arturo. And first of all, thank you for not asking me the previous question because I would have been politically incorrect whatever, whatever thing I would have said. Uh, but anyways, no, I, I, I think that, you know, I've had like shifting views when it comes to the health uh, passport. We started working on that issue or exploring that possibility since I believe September, October last year when the first initiative I heard of Common Pass was like brought out into the public and they were looking for countries to support the this idea. I thought it was a fantastic idea at the beginning, but uh, you rightly point out one of the challenges that it has, and it is discrimination, and it is having travelers of first and second category, you know, and, and people that might have access because they have the res economic resources or the facility to uh, have the passport, get vaccinated, have the, the tests, etc., or even that they are legally registered in the health systems of different countries. So I think that that is one of the biggest, biggest uh, challenges. Uh, we had several meetings and we, we proposed to have those discussions at the level of the OAS, also with the Inter-American Development Bank, which uh, we look for support for them so that we could have a regional discussion about the health passports. It was very difficult to make it evolve, mainly because of, uh, of uh, you know, the, the sovereignty of countries. Every country wants to do their own and it's difficult to have that level of coordination. I think from last year, things have moved, moved quite positively. There are other initiatives like the IATA initiative. Uh, I think those two are the, the most important ones. Uh, the Financial Times, I think, had a, an interesting article saying that we should follow one of those two alternatives. But in the last meeting that we, we had at the level of the OAS in the Tourism Committee, Inter-American Committee, we, re we requested both Common Pass and IATA to come up with a common solution, with only one solution, because the difficulty is that if we have several solutions, then, well, we'll have to opt for one or the other, and how well will they communicate between the two of them? So there are some technological challenges as well as privacy concerns that still need to be addressed. 
Now, I recently read a, an, an article, and I guess you did too, in The Economist uh, that spoke about the, the, the time frame where those health passports had some validity, you know, were relevant. And if it's too early in the vaccination process, they're not relevant because nobody will have the vaccination report on the stamp or on the, on the passport. If it's too late, everybody will have it. So wh why, why would you want to ask for it if you know that pretty much everybody in the world has it? So the, the window, the time frame of opportunity to have an effective pass is relatively short. And I guess this is the, the, the precise moment where it would be of some use, but it's not really rolled out in such an extensive way that it might be useful for countries. So at the end of the day, I think that uh, it will lose its relevance. Maybe in six months or a year time, it will lose its relevance. And I was uh, impressed by the declarations that President Biden made when he said that he would not require any passport for any American citizen. So I think that sets a little bit of the, the standard and the way in, towards the future of what's going to happen with the, with the health passport. Yeah, and this and this, you know, some of you mentioned the word collaboration and cooperation and synergy, um, because this will be crucial. Because if you end up with a Viennese layered cake of seven different approaches in three, four different regions of the world, where some create a unified approach and some others don't, and some ask for it and some don't, it, it's going to have a it's going to have a profound impact again on the ability of the of the sector to pick up and recover. And, and move forward quickly. So, so this this is a very important discussion. Let let, let me let me move you um, slowly float forward into sort of the specificity of of how, how do you uh, on top of this boost uh, uh, business tourism? Uh, how do you how do you make the most of regional mice opportunities to increase business spend? And how do you apply those lessons to to, to try and and, gen, and, and sort of trigger one of the sectors that has been most profoundly affected by the tourism lockdowns uh, and the drop in tourism in general and, tra and international travel that we've seen over the past year. Would anyone want to, Gordon, I don't know if you want to jump into this one. Sure, I, I think um, the confidence of people coming back is going to start with the ability for them to travel safely. And I think what we've seen with the work that we've done in the last three years on the Seamless Travel Journey Initiative of WTTC is that everything in Seamless that was designed for flow and customer experience is now equally applicable to safe, right? We want to minimize time in public areas. We want to touch equipment less uh, or, or avoid it if possible. We don't want to exchange a lot of papers and documents back and forth. And uh, we want to get onto the planes or, or you know, cruises that have been cleaned and sanitized as quickly as possible. Uh, we don't want to be waiting. And the challenge I think right now for the industry, where it's going through a, a difficult period, obviously in terms of cash flow um, and stresses financially, but yet seeing this wave of people that are ready to travel coming from, you know, July, August through to, um, next next season that's coming up through the, the summer winter season um, coming up, we have to implement these pilots to get them going now. We have to get, we can't wait two years to add seamless travel and then when, once the recovery occurs. So the challenge is how do we get that going, get the pilots so that the, the passenger and the experience that they have can see the value of it, both from seamless and, and what we tried to generate as a, as a goal two, three years ago in the start, but from the point of view of safety, that they see that's, that they're not exposing themselves unnecessarily through the process and they feel much more comfortable going through quickly. I think that's, that's a very important opportunity um, for, the, for the industry. And as Julian has said, you know, there's a window of time to do this. And we're, and we're just sort of opening that window in the next six to 12 months where we have a chance to implement those concepts in a very broad way. Martino, Hugo. Um, we are also a member of ICCA, which is basically Congress and Conventions Association. And we really think it's a, it will be a tough market to get back into, specifically when we think that there's been a lot of postponing in, uh, in conferences around the world from associations, and there's a, a timeline that this roll out. 
But at the same time, I think there's uh, two things that we need to tackle early on if we want uh, the business trouble to get back or some um, specific known, um, uh, known schedule already uh, events, which is as a passenger, as a uh, tourism passenger, we need some reassurance we already discussed um, and everyone got a, a foot on that. But from a business perspective, we need just to get some reassurance to companies. What happens on the risk level of their employees? What happens in the, um, do they need some specific insurance for this kind of things? Kind of um, if someone gets kidnapped, that's an extreme situation either, but what kind of things can we do just to, to offset those kind of, uh, of concerns. And on the second side is um, as, as PCO, many, many companies, what they do is try to, to explain their clients that uh, by doing an incentive trip, by doing a conference or by inviting their uh, top sellers to, to on a trip, the ROI uh, the, on this investment uh, just uh, skyrockets. And I think we need to do the same thing here. We need just to explain and, and try to calculate the ROI of why going back in, into one-to-one -one conversations or meetings is better than doing a, yet another Zoom. And I read on a, an article in the newspaper, I think it was in the time in New York Times or probably some other economic one, which says how, how much money companies uh, saved last year by not traveling. So that's probably one of the angles that I need to get back to is showing that there's an ROI on that, on just meeting person to person, going to trade shows, there are certain trade shows that cannot be done virtually when you're just showcasing a new machinery that you need to touch, you need to see how it works and just a video would not do. So I think those are probably the two things that we need to do right away. And again, the window of opportunity is not that big, I think. Well, I think, um, I think it comes back to what we're discussing. Uh, people want to do mice. I, I, I have a strong belief that the um, the home office will create more uh, co will will enhance the condition for meetings because people are not going to be working uh, the whole year in their office so they're going to need to meet more in person so I think that there's going to be a bigger demand uh, today the challenge is that is that there is innumerable permutations as to what you need to have to travel like if you travel from one country to the other but you make a layover in a third country then the rules of those three countries apply to where you're traveling. I mean, I, the, the check-in process at an airline, it takes, you know, four or five times longer because the, the, whoever checks you in needs to know exactly what the country of origin and, and where you're traveling to are requiring, whether it's a PCR, it's a quarantine. In the case of Peru, it requires a face shield. Uh, in the, if you have been in Brazil, you cannot go to certain countries. And, if, and, and that needs to stop because by definition, People will come from very different locations and, and they just cannot be undergoing the stress of, of, of what entails to travel uh, or, or of you not be able to go back home at some point because, you know, you, your plane did a layover in a country that your home country doesn't allow people to fly from. So that needs to get solved uh, and that needs to get solved fast for people to get back. Um, and also, you know, governments need to go back and, and allowing on a safe manner meetings. Today, many countries don't allow gatherings, and as simple as that. So legally, if you wanted to have a meeting of 100 people in Peru in a banquet room, you could not have it. Even though you have all the protocols, you just legally cannot have it. So we need to go back to the basics, allowing uh, governments uh, make sure that they are allowed and working together to, um, to have people trust um, back travel because, you know, uh, avoid fears of getting stuck in one country that's not yours. Um, Julian, I, I'd like, if possible, because of what Hugo has just mentioned of the, of the role of, of governmental um, restrictions and, and, and conditionalities regarding, you know, mass events or, or big meetings, I, I'd like to ask you for your take on that. But there was a, there was a the question that I wanted to, to lead with, with you is, is obviously, and, and you and I come from two sort of two of the most mega diverse and bio, biologically rich countries um, in, in the Americas, Col Colombia and, Me and, and Mexico. And, and obviously, uh, I think there is a, a unique opportunity ahead for the tourism industry 
to focus on sustainable and inclusive development for the future. Also a region with, with huge um, uh, disparities in, in, in income and, 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 and equality. Um, which, which sustainability areas do you think the region can and should address first? Thank you, Arturo. And uh, I don't know if you want to to the meetings industry. I'll just mention a couple of things. One is that there's no doubt that this is one of the most challenging aspects of the crisis that we are facing. You know, the, the meetings industry and the difficulty that it's facing because of its natural uh, reunion of a, a plural number of people. But then I think that this is one of the subsectors in tourism that will never or very difficultly return to normality or what we call normality back in 2019. I think that there is not only a need to, to wait and resist and so that things return to normal, but it really needs to adapt. Uh, and they need to diversify the portfolio of services that they provide, not only having meetings, but for example, we've spoken with several convention centers in Colombia to see if they can also offer their venues as, um, uh, you know, film production facilities like studios or things of that sort to complement the income that may come from, from traditional uh, meetings. Self-organized events as well is very important. And we are going to always, we will never go to go back to 100% uh, meetings as we had in the past. We need a hybrid type of uh, uh, meetings uh, to have. This year in October, we have both ECA meeting and the FIA Expo, the Latin American meetings industry meeting in Colombia. And I think that will be a very, very important opportunity to discuss the future of the industry in the years to come. Now, coming to your second question, and I think that this is crucial. You know, we need to see the pandemic not only as a crisis, but also as an opportunity. And one of the things that we focus mainly in Colombia is to put sustainability in at the heart of the industry. We've passed a bill last year where one of the main aspects of the of the law was to put sustainability uh, again in the center of the industry, giving tools to to reach that can protect better the environment. That at the end of the day, it's the part of the reason why people come to countries like Mexico or Colombia. We also published the first sustainable tourism policy that Colombia has. We work together with the UNWTO, with the OECD, to seek the best practice. And when we have a strategy that has, we have a policy that has six strategies. And one of them, you know, of course, is government, but the other one is also working with the private sector. And you ask well, some of the main challenges when it comes to sustainability. And I would say that there's no doubt that the main, main challenge that we have is climate change. I mean, I don't know if you've read the, the, the book of by Bill Gates uh, recently published, and he pretty much says like, well, you were worried about the pandemic, wait and see what's gonna happen with climate change. So I think we need to put that really, really at the heart of the, of the industry and make the most out of it. We translated the policy into English as well to share it. And if people find uh, some aspects of it interesting, that's something that we should work on. And we worked on two other sustainable um, documents. One is a, uh, an, uh, nature guide uh, interpretation handbook, a, a training manual for uh, guiding for nature interpretation in Colombia, but beautifully published book, also in English with 50 podcasts and things to download in your mobile phone. And uh, um, good practices manual also for sustainability associated with uh, nature uh, uh, tourism. Very happy to share all this information with you, maybe uh, through you, uh, because I think we should increasingly work together to continue working towards sustainable tourism as 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 a non-lawyer um i i'm going to commit the sin of of leading the witness here but i wanted to ask gordon and hugo and martin sort of when we talk about uh, a sustainable and inclusive recovery um in a few months what 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 are two or three indicators that you would be looking for and look backwards to sort of ascertain whether the recovery is in fact sustainable and inclusive. Well, one of the things that, that we are very concerned with is uh, the communities in which we operate. Um, and I think that's been the focus. Actually, that's the purpose of our company is to you know, generate happiness in people and prosperity in our destinations. That's, that's why we rise every morning to work. 
Um, and I think that has, you know, that, that has always been a priority, but, you know, we tend to see more the destination as a place that will, you know, we, we want the destination to be well because we want it to be sexy. We want there not to be crime. So people will come to our hotels. We want it to uh, yield good labor. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, we have to go beyond that. Uh, we have to make sure that that the tourism industry, it's um, it's 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 and 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 the good thing is that the pandemic has shown the, the loss of jobs has shown how how dependent many of these economies are to tourism. So now we need to go the other way around. We need to make sure that not only those people recover their jobs, but that our industry is it's it's a it. You know, uh, uh, we, there used to be a president that talked about the axis of evil. Um, you know, we, we, want, we want our industry to be uh, an axis of good, you know, uh, of prosperity. And, and I think that now more than ever, and it needs to be at a local level. We do it every day. Um, all, our, all our general managers in their scorecard have, you know, helped the community in which they operate. Um, and the pandemic took us, you know, very, made that a top priority. And I think that needs to be the case and needs to continue. And, and I think, yes, we need to work with uh, the environment. Many, many, there, there's many priorities, but if every hotel could take care of the community in which they operate, uh, for example, in the hotel business, there will be a substantial uh, uh, forward um, and, and improvement on that, on that aspect. I think you're with me on that, that, that sense of that sense of co-stakeholdership is is very important. And, and, and Gordon, I, Gordon and Martin, um, would would you want to comment on this too? Or I'll jump in with a maybe a different indicator, which would be from a traveler's perspective. How long does it take for me to clear through borders and provide the necessary documentation? So, whether it's um, you know looking at uh, what do I have to fill in. For example, is it electronic? Is it digital? Can I do it then? Do I have to bring paper? Is it a certificate or a test? How how consistently recognized is it throughout the region? Does it make that makes it simpler? Um, can I do it digitally in advance? Right before I even fly, before I even get on the plane, can I give you everything I need and do the upload and provide my identity so that you can actually allow me to move through the process very quickly? Those would be good indicators that we've taken a crisis and i think you know there's a, a recent study from mckinsey saying that the, the crisis has accelerated the move towards digital channels in sales and everything we do in our lives by five to ten years so is the travel sector taking advantage of this are we moving forward in a way that can put the you know the, make it easy for travelers to go through this process of providing what they need to provide quickly, simply, and consistently to all the stops along the way. Martin? I don't want to sound pessimist, um, but the good thing about having an indicator is that we can act upon that and just make, uh, make the changes to improve. Um, there's a couple of things that have been touched before, and one is the inequalities in Latin America, and specifically can talk about South America. And one concern that we have is that um, most of our suppliers and people, people we work with are uh, SMEs or, or just uh, individual contractors. Just think about tour guides, which is a, a person, uh, most, more often than not, it's a, it's a woman. And if there's no tourism, there's no job. And in most cases, in small communities, there's no alternative of, of a job rather than tourism or being on social welfare. So not having tourism is just... Um, is being on, on either side of the poverty line, in some cases, in some smaller communities. So I think that um, there's things that we can do just, and, and I would monitor just um, two things. One is uh, the number of tour guides back back to back on a job uh, in time compared to what was pre-COVID. And the second thing is how, that, how can we just push for these smaller communities? So in, in that terms, I would just, push for certain things that we can just change in our services is, for example, um, increase the number of overnights in, in smaller destinations or side destinations compared to the bigger cities. And, and it's not that I want just to 
to lose any business or anyone lose, loses business compared to another one. But if we want, need to push for these smaller contractors or, or these smaller enterprises, we need just to help them. And the way to help them is just reinvent the, the reinvent the, 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 the service delivery. And at the same time in Latin America, when we go for this for this kind of thing, this usually it's open places, uh, less travel, no over tourism. So it's also a way just to market differently. So focusing on these two, two ind indicators, kind of uh, all the nights in smaller destinations or side destinations, and the number of uh, tour guides or individual contractors backing having a job, I think that those are the ones that we need to, to tackle immediately just to solve a little bit the inequalities. All the rest will just follow. We're, we're, we're now reaching the end of, of, of our panel. So, so let, let, me, let me sort of pose a question that I would ask each one of you to respond. Uh, I'd ask you to do it in two, three minutes max. Uh, but obviously, sort of, you, you've all heard about the black swans, the, the crises, the event that no one could foresee that um, materialized out of the blue. Um, the pandemic was not a black swan. It, it's what uh, uh, some of us call a gray rhino. It's there, the signs of it, like climate change. It's there, the signs are there. It was obvious that, especially after H1N1 and the Ebola crises, that we were going to face a global pandemic at some point. So, so the, the two questions that I wanted you to end this panel with and, and share with, with our audience is, what are some of the lessons learned from this crisis that will help uh, the region and the sector uh, become increasingly resilient so that it may be better prepared for a health crisis in the future? And, and what inspires you? What inspires you going forward as, as, as we learn the lessons of what has happened and as you look at the sector going forward? And why don't we start, uh, uh, why don't we start with Gordon and then we'll, we'll, we'll uh, go with each one of you and wrap up. Thanks very much, Arturo. I think when we look at the question of resilience, we can see an example in, I'll say not just the travel sector, but broad government to citizen services. Um, the digital route offers a ability for many people to choose a different way of interacting with government, whether it's, you know, as we saw in this crisis, delivery of social assistance, um, keeping services up and running. Uh, we saw many of the governments around the world shut down their visa operations, yet there are ways of doing visa applications online, for example. We also see, I think, a real opportunity here where I'll say, you know, small, medium-sized countries can actually leapfrog. We see this already happening now. Um, you know, our, our new parent company in Trust is doing a lot of work with companies in digital identity. They're working with Caribbean countries, for example, and leapfrogging them, taking them forward from uh, the, the paper-based documentation of identity, for example, and going forward right into digital and digital citizen cards, which allow the delivery of services uh, seamlessly, which can continue even though offices might be closed and people are working from home. And that kind of approach can also apply, of course, to the travel sector, where the ability to simplify the life of a traveler through digital means, and this is a, a key tenant of the safe and seamless travel journey, the digital identity is a core piece of that and the ability to then deliver services through that mechanism. So, you know, that, that theme is a very strong theme in terms of continuation of service delivery and a very strong theme in terms of building resilience in the industry that I think will last for many, many years. Thank you, Gordon. Hugo? Very deep question, and we don't have a lot of time. Um, I think I'm going to go back to my initial message. I think this was a big dose of humility and vulnerability. Uh, from a personal level, I spent two weeks attached to a mechanic ventilator, and I almost died because of COVID. Um, and I think, you know, so, so I can attest from a personal and professional level that it's been very hard, and, and, and this dose of humility and vulnerability was key. Um, to getting us to basically to, to have uh, this type of events in a rear end mirror. Before COVID, we were concerned with how many hotels we were going to grow and how many more points of EBITDA could we get from the hotel. This made us go to the basics and put health and safety first, which we did always kind of conceptually, but never in practice. Um, and that was, that was great. The other thing is uh, the sense of purpose. Um, Everybody that worked in our company had their worst economic year on 2020. 
people made the least amount of money in bonuses, tips, and throughout. We did discounts on salaries, etc. Yet at the same time, we had the highest employee satisfaction results that we've ever had. And that's because we made sure that people knew the purpose behind what we were doing. And I think as an industry, that's great. The purpose of lifting communities out of poverty, as Martin said, in our region, uh, being employed versus being unemployed is the difference between being poor or rich. And, this is a and being rich, be, not, not rich, but be, being poor or not being poor, be, being below poverty line. And I think being below or above poverty line, uh, some, there's been some statistics that will buy you 10 to 15 years of life. Um, so it's very important. And I think that connecting with the purpose has been key. Um, and also the leapfrog um, concept that Gordon mentioned. I mean, there's many things that we never thought we could do remote, remotely that we can, but also we learned that there's no substitute to person-to-person -person touch. And I think those are two um, great lessons that there's a lot that we can do remotely, but also there are things that we cannot do remotely. And, and that's great for our industry and great for us. Thanks, Hugo. I'm, 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 getting, I'm getting yanked with the proverbial um, hook from the side of the, of the stage. Martin, Martin and Julian, in, in one word, um, what, what gives you hope uh, and in terms of resilience going forward? V very quickly, because they're, they're, they're flashing my red light here. <laughs> Sure. Um, I don't want to repeat what my colleagues already said, but I think I would go back to one thing is we learned that we have to make take all decisions based on data. It's not a social mood. It's not a political mood. It's what data tells us to do. We saw that by stopping mobility, everything went upside down. And it was not based on data. It was just based on the social mood that politicians were just looking at or or fear rather than, or we can say. And the other thing is, and, and this is part of the humility that uh, Hugo was talking about is, as, as, a, as on a sea level position, we think we are Superman, that we need to just solve every single problem worldwide. And in the end, it's uh, after 13 months of this very stressful situation, all of us pass through many, many tough things. And I think there's one, th thing that we need to always think about is we could never have done it without our staff who is back in our, our shoulders. And yeah. as Hugo said, their salaries were reduced, the money was reduced, uh, their income was reduced, but they never lost hope, lost spirit, and they are always backing us just to continue going forward. And that's also what makes me at least wake up every morning and say, okay, let's try another thing again. Let's, let's go for it. And I think that's Another key we're, learning. We're, we're going to have to wrap this up, but um, I, I think you will concur that this has been a riveting conversation. I think uh, our four panelists, Julian, Hugo, Gordon, and Martin, have been extremely thoughtful in their engagement with us this morning. I want to thank all of them for, for joining us, and I want to thank you for, 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 for watching this, uh, this very important panel for the region and for the tourism sector in Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you.